Hello and welcome to the Fighting Spirit Podcast. As always, I'm Jason and I'm here to bring you the retrospective on UFC 244 where we predicted correctly Jorge Gamebred Masvidal took home the BMF title. It was kind of a weird way that it played out, not the BMF way I think any of us expected, but it did look like a phenomenal fight up until that point. Let's get into it. Also, we were 8-12 and 12 on the night, so we came in at two-thirds of uh, our correct fight pick. So, good performance on my behalf. I'm happy about it. We had some shakiness going on during the main card, but we were rolling to start things out, and I think we did a great job overall. Like I said, though, let's get into it. Here's the show. <laughs> All right, so in that main event, that BMF, we had George Masvidal pick up a great victory. And uh, for Diaz, you know, let's just talk about the way it ended. So obviously Diaz gets caught very early on in the first round, catches an elbow, loses balance a bit. I don't think, you know, Diaz was going out, but he did dip his head and Masvidal cracks him in the head with that great head kick as he's dipping out. And, you know, what caused, you know, the cut to open? Was it the elbow? Was it the kick? I'm not really sure. However, the end result is the same. We end up with a doctor stoppage in the end of the third round or start of the fourth, however you want to look at it. And, you know, the doctor came in. And Diaz is saying he wants to go. He wants to go. Doctor says, I can't let it go. I mean, his eye was kind of folded down. I don't think it was worthy of stopping the fight in a lot of ways, but... I understand the position of the doctor. I also understand the position, you know, of anybody watching where you're basically getting, you know, watching Diaz get his ass kicked by Masvidal for three straight rounds. So could Diaz have made a comeback? I, I don't know. It's hard to say, you know, during the grappling exchanges, I thought Masvidal's top game was so good. Obviously, Nate maybe could have hooked up with a, a heel hook, you know, to end out that third round. So who, who really knows? I thought Diaz was starting to get going. I thought his cardio was looking like it was going to actually turn the tide. It was probably going to be a too little, too late situation. You know, in the fifth round, I could have seen Diaz winning the round. But, it, you know, he was outstruck 3-1, to one, and he was hurt early. He was hurt often. Masvidal just, his hands were phenomenal, his wrestling was phenomenal, he looked like a guy that could be fighting for the 170 pound belt, you know, let alone the BMF, Masvidal just looks phenomenal right now, and Diaz, you know, typical slow start fashion, just could not get it going, and I think that early cut opening up really screwed him up, you know, had he... Had he not caught that elbow, I, I think he would have been fine. I don't know if Diaz even anticipated catching elbows from Masvidal. We see him as kind of a striker. I don't think he expected, you know, that Muay Thai element, you know, boxing style strikers, I mean to say. I don't think he expected that Muay Thai element to be there, and, and Masvidal just had it, uh, had him dead to rights the whole fight. Diaz at no point looked great, and I made this call. Like I said, it was down the middle for me. The, the fight didn't go down the middle. I thought it was decisively Masvidal, but... It uh, was a good call on my behalf. So, um, yeah, Diaz just struggled all night. He couldn't get going, and and he, that's uh, that's all she wrote. Moving on to the next one, Darren Till, Kelvin Gastelum. So I said this one. My heart had Till. My numbers had Gastelum. But what happened in this fight was really weird. So we ended up with a split decision win for Till, and I was happy about that. I did not put money on this fight. I would not have uh, done so if you know I was you either. But. It, uh, you know, the way this thing played out, it was just weird. So Darren Till, you know, he was, I think he had a lack of confidence going into this fight. And he performed well. You know, he was looking for counter-striking. He was moving well and out of the pocket. I don't know what was up with Gaslam. I think it was Gaslam's fault why we had a boring fight here. He just wasn't willing to engage like he was with Israel Adesanya. He wasn't willing to step in and take a chance. Uh, and, and Till just kind of shut the door and made him hesitate at every move. And I think Till wasn't able to play any of his counter-striking game. Uh, he kept coming forward with good one-twos, and, and that was really most of the fight, even though Gaslam did ultimately outstrike him. I thought Till did just a little bit much, a little bit more damage, and he obviously had the advancing uh, you know, edge, and he had the, I think, ring control edge in that fight. The grappling exchanges, you know, a place where Till maybe could have, you know, done better he didn't really look good at all he couldn't really get the fight to the mat uh it ended up being one takedown each obviously uh till with that leg you know that that kick catch and kind of takes him down by walking him backwards and losing his balance and gaslam gets a little more traditional takedown but 
this was this was a really tough fight to watch just from a entertainment perspective you know I, I always get shades of wonder boy woodley too and i watch stuff like this a lot of fainting a lot of hesitation uh, and i think till did everything he could in his game plan to make the fight interesting and uh, gaslam just just wouldn't play that game and that denial to play any game is really what makes it boring when guys aren't willing to execute their styles be it wrestling or, uh, you know, clinches, or Muay Thai, or whatever the heck your game is, when you're not willing to step in, you're hesitating, it ends up being boring, and I think Gaslam gave that to us. Sure, I mean, we could say Till didn't, you know, overstep either, but, you know, I, I think uh, I think Gaslam should have been the one trying to get inside because of that reach disadvantage, so I'm putting the, the blame on him for the lack of entertainment. Either way, though, Till gets a win, I'm happy about it, uh, even though I wasn't able to make that call, you know, like I said, he had some bad losses, and I don't think his numbers represented how good he is. Uh, and this fight doesn't really help his case either going forward because uh, he didn't put much output out there. But uh, anyways, I was happy to see Till. I like the guy a lot, so more power to him, and I hope to see him again. Next fight, though, Stephen Thompson, Vicente Luque. Uh, Wonder Boy looking really good. I thought Luque won the first round. You know, or it was it was damn near close at least. And then Wonder Boy, his striking. Uh, was just there all night. I think Luque was playing his game. I, I thought Luque was going to be able to get in and out of the pocket well enough that he was going to be able to avoid Wonder Boy's game. And he looked good at first. I thought that, you know, he, he was able to get in and out. He wasn't giving Thompson all of those great counter shots that he wanted by coming forward with a flurry like, you know, kind of um, Woodley had done to Wonder Boy, kind of catching him off balance and not giving him that great counter strike opportunity. Uh, instead, though, he ends up falling for that bait of, of going in and stepping, you know, into and not moving out fast enough, uh, or not just plowing forward uh, against Thompson like Woodley did, and uh, he ended up just fighting his fight, uh, Wonder Boy's fight that is, catching a lot of counter shots, catching a lot of kicks. I mean, some of those some of those uh, body shots with via kick were devastating. He pushed him back, uh, you know, clear across the octagon, and. Uh, he, he just looked really good. He looked like Thompson of old. He looked like vintage Thompson. He looked phenomenal. Uh, Luke, you know, I, I think the guy has a future. Uh, we, we're not going to call it correct. Um, but, uh, yeah, he just he just needs to fight somebody, I think, a little more in his wheelhouse. What's what's this next for Thompson, though? Welterweight division? Gets a win over an up-and-comer like that? I don't know, man. This this is a good one. Obviously, he lost to Mosby. He lost to Till, 1-7. I'm not sure where this leaves Thompson, but uh, and that lost to Pettis, but he's, he's still hanging in there, man. Don't count this dude out. He could very well get in there and put on a display against a title holder. Who knows? Anyways, moving on to the next one. Derek Lewis, Blagoy, Ivanov. So I, I, this was tough. This was another split decision on the night. I had picked Ivanov, and he looked pretty good. He was getting takedowns on Lewis. He just wasn't throwing that many strikes, you know. He didn't he didn't put on enough of a striking clinic, I think, to get the unanimous decision. You know, Lewis did outstrike him by 11. Uh, I thought he did more damage when he was striking as well. Although, Ivanov, though, threatened so many submissions that I think maybe those just weren't looked at uh, deeply enough by the judges to get that call. Granted, though, I mean, you have to complete a submission. They are not dramatic like striking, you know, in the judges' eyes most of the time. So, you know, you can't just chain together a bunch of submission attempts without actually getting one it's it's a little more black and white i think for judges uh, whereas when you crack a guy and he wobbles that can very easily become a 10-8 just because you're chaining two three four five submissions together doesn't mean you get that 10-8 and you know and that's just the way mma scoring goes and so ivanov didn't get any 10-8s in that fight and not that i think he deserved one either to be perfectly honest you know ivanov uh he <laughs> he was uh he, he just i don't know he was looking like a slow methodical heavyweight and Lewis was just coming forward brawling style and I think he caught Ivanov you know a little flat-footed at times and uh, was throwing bombs and Lewis at no point was really hurt I think by anything Ivanov did you know Ivanov had him in that great shoulder lock on the ground and you know you saw Lewis right just put his thumb up just chilling just chilling knowing he can't get it and then boom explodes back up to his feet and he did that with, off of every takedown. And Ivanov at no point had really full ground control. So great performance by Lewis. You know, Ivanov is a Sambo gold medalist uh, or world champion. So he definitely put on an excellent performance. And the next one, uh, this is the one I was happiest about to call in the night because I, I, I thought that this was one of the hardest fights to get right. I thought this was a huge, you know, uh, step up in competition for both of these guys. Kevin Lee, Gregor Gillespie. 
You know, we've seen Kevin Lee on the slide, you know, so to go up against a guy who's looking as phenomenal as Gillespie was coming into this, I thought that it was going to be a really tall order. And then Gillespie, you know, going up against a guy like Kevin Lee, I mean, he's only fought up and comers. We're talking about a guy that's fought for the title in Kevin Lee. So Gillespie's now going up against a very high caliber fighter. You know, so how's he going to perform once he goes up against somebody who's, you know, in a lot of ways better or just as good as him, right? He's not fighting cans anymore at this point. And Gillespie looked scared to engage, you know? Uh, Lee came in this kind of like crouch style. I mean, it looked like he was going to, you know, try to shuck the takedowns if they were coming in uh, and just looked like the superior striker. So the knockdown or knockout that he gets was phenomenal, right? I mean, great head movement. Uh, Gillespie comes in with a nice little, I can't remember if it's a jab or cross, comes across, and then he just glides his head right out of the way, hits him, I believe, I believe he hit him with a right, and then a left leg kick, uh, sorry, head kick, and he just knocks him cold out, he's going backwards, it was a great combination, I think that tri-star training is really coming through for Kevin Lee, and I think we're going to see great things about this guy, I, I texted my buddy, uh, you know, off the, because of what I said on the podcast, I said, he can beat him, he can beat Khabib, you know, and I think, you know, my buddy was like, I don't know about that. And I think that's fair, uh, Eric, out there. Uh, I think that's fair to say that. But I I got to say, if he could beat Gillespie, who had that style, the only problem is Gillespie didn't get any of his wrestling style in like I thought he was going to be able to. I thought we'd have a longer fight. Um, but either way, though, he caught him. He's looking good. I'm glad to see Kevin Lee back to his winning ways. And uh, I hope that someday he can fight Khabib. Who knows who he's going to fight next? I think he's got good things coming for him. This Farah Sahabi, TriStar Training, you know, the guy that got GSP to his level. This guy can do it. You know, he could be a second coming of a GSP. I, I'd love to see the Motown Phenom do it. So, uh, great win, spectacular fashion. And who knows what's next for Kevin Lee. He got a great win. All right, and the next one, uh, this one kind of sucked for us. Uh, Corey Anderson, Johnny Walker. Johnny Walker threw one strike, uh, and uh, he just, I don't know, Johnny Walker is an awkward fighter, and Corey Anderson just came in traditional as hell and put it on him. You know, Johnny Walker didn't have an opportunity to catch him with a flying knee. He was just getting smothered. No movement, no explosiveness. He ain't ready for John Jones. Let's just put it that way. Corey Anderson shut down the hype train and picked up performance of the night money with it. Also, performance of the night money did go to Kevin Lee and Stephen Thompson as well. So those were our 50 G's baby winners. Uh, but anyways, Johnny Walker. Yeah, I don't know, man. Shut down the hype train. I was I was really suspecting that he was going to beat a guy like Anderson, a guy who does have difficulty shutting the door. We talked about those four KOs over all of his wins. I didn't think he had it in him to shut the door early, and I, I think he wanted to shut down the hype train. He, he took what I and a lot of other people were saying about him, and he took it in his own uh, you know, his own mind. He put it as a chip on his shoulder, and he proved that he's a badass mother effer uh, to be in the UFC, and he shut down Johnny Walker. So, uh, you know, what's next for Walker? I think he fights another, you know, middling opponent, uh, and Corey Anderson makes a freaking statement that he's ready to go up and fight somebody better. Uh and, you know, I think the the end result here is ultimately, uh, you know, away from Anderson and Walker, because what I was talking about was Walker probably fighting Dominic Reyes, but he didn't win in spectacular fashion. So that ends that. I think we now got a clear cut. Uh, Dominic Reyes, John Jones for the light heavyweight title. There is the Blaskovitz fight out there, too. I just don't think that one's as much fun. I think Reyes has, you know, the better streak going on right now, and I think he's the one that gets it done, and, and Walker's now out of the picture off that loss. So hopefully he can come back and, you know, get back to his winning ways, but uh, he did not pick up any W uh, for us that evening. So the rest of these here, uh, yeah, we're on our winning streak now. So the next six of these fights we did get correct. So we only got two right uh, going, you know, back. Some of those were split decisions. But I am happy that these are all going to be wins for us. So Shane Burgos defeats Marquard Armarcani. This was a great win by Burgos. Marikani put him in trouble very early on, knocked him down, cut his eye. He exploded out, I think, in a striking style that Burgos did not anticipate. And uh, he nearly got him in a great uh, choke. He nearly got him. But then once we get into the second and third rounds, um, Burgos just wasn't having any of that grappling exchanges, and he really put it on him. He outstruck him 5-1 to one and put the hurting on Armour Kani until he got the KO in the third round. Uh, via punches uh, very late in the round only about 30 seconds left in that one when he picked up the win but Burgos those Tiger Schulman guys they are super aggressive they all are guys like him Jimmy Rivera uh, I believe Lyman Good as well they're all super aggressive 
and, uh, and even Ar- Arce. Arce is, is also a Tiger Schulman fighter, um, and he put it on. He showed why the Schulman guys are, are so good by just outstriking out out everything. Um, Marconi on that one. Except for, I guess, early on grappling, right? And the next one, Shabazian or Shabazian defeats Brad Tavares very early on. This kid's phenomenal. He's 21 years old. He's still undefeated in the UFC. Uh, he just made, you know, Brad Tavares not look like a veteran, not look like a guy who's been there for a very long time. He gets him with that great head kick, and uh, he shuts him down early. There's not really much to say about it. Shabazian is just looking phenomenal. He's looking like a guy. I think that, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hate versus him versus Darren Till, to be perfectly honest. You know, uh, Till got kind of a ho-hum win against Gastelum. Shabazian's looking so good right now. Uh, I think Till just coming up to 185. I think that's a good fight to make. You know, I, I don't know if they will do that fight. I think Shabazian probably needs a few more tests. And obviously Till's fought for the title. They really like that guy. But I think that's a good fight to make. Till and Shabazian at 185. I like that one as kind of a knee-jerk reaction. Moving on, we had Rosenstruck defeat Arlovsky, and Ar- Arlovsky, he uh, just not looking good these days. You know, he got clipped on the jaw, went out immediately. His chin just isn't there anymore, and that's what I'd said on the podcast. You know, even though he had the intelligence to be in a guy like Rosenstruck, he can't eat the punches from that guy. He hits like a freight train, and so he's not going to be able to pick up a win. You got to eat one to give one. He just can't eat him anymore, and so he goes down in about 30 seconds. Next one, Caitlin Shkagan, Jennifer Maya got this one correct as well. Shkagan just looked just a hint better, right? Outstruck her, um, was able to defend the takedowns, and I think she just bought a ticket to go fight Valentina Shevchenko. Did she look good enough to be Valentina, though? No, 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 absolutely not. Maya is not as good a striker. She's a BJJ-style fighter, uh, and we know that Valentina is well-rounded in all aspects of the game, and I don't think Shkagan is going to have it uh, to go up against the bullet. So, she stamped herself a ticket, I think, but I just don't see her getting it done. It's going to take a miracle, in my opinion, for Shkagan to take out Valentina. In our uh, next contest, Lyman Good defeats Chance Ren Counter. Ren Counter looking okay. Uh, I thought Lyman Good, again, another, I believe, Tiger Schulman fighter, just came out freaking swinging, banging hard. And uh, Ren Counter, you know, he tried to get into the grappling to slow, you know, the advance down of Good, but Good was just too good uh he, his aggression was there his strength was there i mean the guy looks like he's fucking juiced to the t- <laughs> I just swore i shouldn't do that i was gonna edit it out but and you know fuck it anyway <laughs> chance, uh live and good picks up a win and then it'll, it's so deep into the podcast yeah I, I don't know who's still listening at this point but if you are thank you for listening uh the last one's here we had hakeem dawadu and julio arce uh, we had uh, a Dawadu pick up a win. It was a split decision. Uh, we had Arce pick up that takedown, which I think might have put it as a split, but he outstruck him pretty handily, and I think it was a good call. So like I said, 8-4 and four on the night, or 8-12, for 12, however you want to look at it. We got back to our winning ways. We had an outstanding performance, and I'm really happy to have made these calls. Uh, so going forward, we're going to have UFC Moscow next week. That's going to be taking place, I believe, at 2 p.m., uh, on Saturday, so just watch out for that one. Uh, we'll have those fight picks coming out soon, and yeah, it was, we just had a really good performance overall. I'm a little sad to see that the BMF belt went out the way it did with the doctor stoppage. It's not the BMF way, but uh, you know sometimes you just got to accept that uh, you know the doctors are looking out for the fighters, and you know I, I'd rather see Diaz have the fight stopped than him go blind, and, and that's just the reality of it. And you got to accept that as a fan. You know these guys put it all on the line. But uh, you don't want them to lose their lives, you know, in 35, 34 years of age. You want them to be able to retire and live good lives after the fact. So I'm happy to see the doctor come in ultimately, especially when Masvidal was kicking his ass like he was. Could Maz- could Diaz have won a round? Sure, absolutely. Could he have submitted Masvidal later on? Ah, maybe, you know, maybe it's possible. But it just wasn't very likely. And uh, it, it went out, I think, in a good way that saved Diaz a little bit of damage. So anyways... Uh, yeah, like I said, had a good night, happy to make that call, and I will talk to you again, and until then, happy fight picking.